Well, good to see you this weekend. I hope that you are doing well. My name is Keith, and I'm so glad that you're at Grace, and you picked a great weekend to be here because we are starting a new message series. And what that means for us is that we're going to take uh, several weeks, and we're going to dialogue around a topic or an idea or a concept. Uh, that's what we do at Grace is we have these conversations that last somewhere normally between like four to six weeks where we talk about scripture in some way. Maybe it's through a particular book of the Bible or a need that we all feel in our lives or maybe through something going on in our culture. And this particular series has been something that's been in my heart, in my mind, in my soul for a long time. Uh, and I'm, I'm excited. Uh, I have a lot of passion and enthusiasm to get into this series, but I also have some apprehension. And not, not apprehension because... I'm fearful of what I believe God wants me to ultimately say to the church, but, but I know our church and I know the size of our church and the diversity of our church. And I recognize that in some regards, um, this is going to create some division and frustration with some of you as you navigate uh, these, this series over the next few weekends. For some of you, uh, I'm going to not go far enough. Uh, you're going to want me to say more and push more and push deeper and push harder on a group of people or on a particular topic. For others of you, uh, I'm going to press too hard. It's going to feel like I'm being restrictive and mean and keeping people away from the church. And, and yet in all of it, uh, I'm going to do my best to listen to the Spirit of God and tell you what I think God really wants you to know and ultimately what I believe the Scripture would say. And I hope that your heart and your posture is ready to listen and receive whether you're a Christian uh, or not. And so excited to begin this conversation. Uh, uh, a few years ago, I believe it was, I was with one of my friends and we were headed to an event downtown. And where we had parked, we had to walk uh, through the short north. And so we were walking along the storefronts and restaurant fronts of the short north. And as we were walking, uh, we passed, I can't remember whether it was a restaurant or a shop or whatever it was. And this came up uh, in the window and my friend saw this and he saw this particular sign. And some of you have seen this sign. Some of you have seen this maybe in uh, someone in your neighborhood's yard or you've seen it down in the short north or you've seen it posted in various contexts. And there's not really a formal name for what this is, uh, it, but really it's a, it's a worldview. It's a set of statements. We would refer to it in the Christian world as like a creedal uh, thing. It's a creed. And so we're going to refer to it for the course of this series as the secular creed. And this secular creed, it articulates these kind of thoughts in this house if you put this in front of your home, we believe black lives matter, women's rights are human's rights, no human is illegal, science is real, love is love, kindness is everything. And my friend said, hey, what do you think about that? And I'm like, like right now you wanna know what I think about that? As we're like walking to this event, you wanna know? I mean, like this is a, this is a big thing. What do, you, what do you think about that? And my, my particular friend in this case is, is not a follower of Jesus. And he obviously knows that I am a Christian and a follower of Jesus. And so he was interested in my perspective on these realities because he's thought about them and he knows I've thought about them. And the truth is you, you've thought about them. Whether you've you know, wanted to think about them or not, they're in front of you. They're on your news cycle. They're on podcasts you listen to. They come up in various conversations that were around that, that you end up hearing and seeing these things and you process those. In fact, when you, when you see that creed, some of you are like, okay, are all those things true? Are they not true? Are some of them true? Okay, are they true, but is there an undercurrent to some of them that I'm not supposed to be supportive of them? Like, how am I supposed to feel about those? And you're, you're really not sure what to do. And by the way, your kids are being exposed to those and they're not sure what to think sometimes. And in a church, you're not sure what to think. And, and this is the truth. What I really wanted to do was not go to the event, but I wanted to, I wanted to sit down with my friend and I wanted to grab a coffee and I, I wanted to look across the table and I wanted to say, Okay, if you really want to know, let's, let's have a conversation. And my response to all that is this. My response is this. I, I, if you want to talk, if you really want to dialogue on it, my, my response is this. And as we get into this conversation, this series about the kind of response we would have with our friends and our coworkers and our neighbors and our loved ones, I think what's interesting is that that this creed shows up in a particular environment. It's an environment of our day that you feel. In fact, some of you felt this even when you began to read that this weekend. And here are some of the words I would use to describe the environment we, we're in. We, we live in a world that has a mixture of the following. It has a mixture of being overwhelmed, of being outraged and outspoken around these challenging topics. We live in a culture, we live in a world that has a, a mixture 
of being overwhelmed, being outraged and outspoken around these particular topics. For some of you, when you see that creed or you even knew what this series was about, man, like you just kind of got nervous in your soul because like this is just all overwhelming. Like it's just too much. You want to have a thought. You want to be able to give a response, but it's just big and it's like, wow, everywhere I go, everywhere I see it and it's being talked about and, and you just don't know what to do. You, you've got people that are attached to these things. You've got, you've got people that you love, organizations that you care about and you're just kind of overwhelmed. And for some of you, you just can't even get out of the starting block. In fact, that's often what I hear from people at the church about this stuff. It's key. Pastor, I don't even know where to begin. I'm just overwhelmed. It's just like too much. Where do, where do I start? Others of you, you see those and you're outraged. You're ready to find your phone and just start typing something into it to post because you're angry because your country is being taken because morality is going to hell in a handbasket because people don't care anymore like they used to and the world's wrong and the world's messed up and they're getting our kids and, and you're, you're just feeling all kinds of some kind of way that you're frustrated. You wanna, you wanna fight, you wanna push. You're like, man, Thanksgiving can't get here soon enough. I got a relative I need to talk to because <laughs> you're outraged. And amidst that, some of you are outraged, but you you're not necessarily ready to talk, but part of our culture is not just overwhelmed and outraged. Part of our culture is we're outspoken, like, like people think they're supposed to talk. And we have the vehicles with the cell phone now and with social media to just allow people to say whatever they want. And man, beginning in that 2020 COVID timeline, it was already true in our culture, but now people thought, if I have an opinion, I should tell you. I should just express it and put it out there. So now we live in a culture where people are just, they're not only outraged and they're not only overwhelmed. A lot of people are outspoken and they just can't wait to talk and get it out there. And again, you, you experience this. You, you see people talking about it, whether it's Tucker Carlson or The View or your podcast or your news channel of choice. It's showing up and people are processing these realities. And so here as Christians, we're supposed to engage into this environment and say, our response is. And here's what's crazy. When you start to do that and you start to tell people what your response is, people push back at you. And it's interesting why they push back at you because here's the truth. Some people, they just come to a place where they go, I can't believe what you believe. <laughs> and then other people are confused by what you don't believe. Have you ever noticed this, that you tell someone your thought, you give them your response, and some people are like, I cannot believe that you believe that. How could you believe that? That is old-fashioned, that is archaic, that is out of date. You are homophobic, you are transphobic, you are xenophobic, you are judgmental, you are mean, you are racist, you are condescending, you are out of touch, et cetera, et cetera. Some people are like, I cannot believe you believe that. And other people are like, how can't you believe that? Like, that's just good human decency. Like, don't you see people and love people and you call yourself a Christian? And so you find yourself going, man, I'm in a space where sometimes I talk to people and people are like, what kind of moron are you for believing that? And then you talk to someone else that are like, what kind of moron are you that you don't believe that? And you're like, what am I supposed to do? What, where am I supposed to land on this? How am I supposed to articulate this? What am I supposed to say to my college age kids when they come home and they say their university or their school or their social environment is teaching them this? What am I supposed to do? Well, what the goal of this series is, is again, just to sit across the table and to do really two things. It's to do two things. And, and I put it this way, that, that we're to try and provide a Christian response, try and provide a Christian response and training to effectively incarnate the environment. The goal of this series is to try and provide a Christian response and training to effectively incarnate the environment. Well, let me try to unpack some words on that. The first is incarnate. Incarnate means to indwell or to move into the neighborhood. And so really the heart of this is to try and say, hey, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our offices, in our families, on our ball fields, in our dorm rooms, how do we incarnate? How do we move into the neighborhood? How do we be present? Not run from this stuff, not hide from this stuff, but how do we incarnate? How do we live there and actually be in the world and navigate it? And it's to provide a response. Now, I, I chose my response is very clearly for this series, and I want that word to be really clear in your soul, because here's what I'm learning the older I get. Listen to me. There's a big difference between a response and a reaction. And what a lot of us have is a reaction. 
Our response is a more above the line, controlled, disciplined, thoughtful, grace and truth, God honoring approach. And we wanna have a response. And part of that response is the content, but part of that response is the posture. It's the attitude, it's the way we engage it. And then we wanna do training because I just know this, like a lot of us don't know what to say. Or a lot of us are saying the wrong things or a lot of us believe in the wrong things. And so how do we make sure that we have an appropriate training to know with these topics, how do we talk about them? Now, I want you to know this. Here at Grace, we don't run towards controversial topics, but we also don't hide from them. Some of you, like your posture has been like, get after this right away, get after this right away, get after this right away. And others of you were like, don't ever talk about it, don't ever talk about it, don't ever talk about it. The truth is, sometimes we don't want to give oxygen in our culture to things that are just not helpful or to things that can be confusing or to sometimes just to talk about it because it's controversial. But on the other side, I know this, if the church of Jesus Christ doesn't disciple you in something, the world will. So we have to find this balance between saying, you know, we're not just going to run to it because people are thinking about it, but we also need to run to it because people are thinking about it. And as we navigate this conversation, as I said, for some of you, I'm going to say too much. For some of you, I'm going to say too little. For some of you, you're going to want me to get them, whoever them is. And for others of you, you're going to want to make sure I don't get them. And then for some of you, what you want is you want me to give you political statements. You want me to give you political statements. Let me say very, very clearly, this is not a series on political statements. This is not a series on political statements. In fact, my responsibility to the Lord Jesus Christ and to this church is not to give you your politics. It's to give you Jesus and his word. And after I do that, I trust the Holy Spirit to deal with your politics. But it's not my job to come up here and say, in light of this biblical truth, this is what you should do. In fact, sometimes the line between biblical truth and our politics and how we should vote and how we should engage our culture isn't as straight as we think it is. Let me try to give just one example, and I hope I'm not confusing with this. Let's take the issue of pornography. Pornography is 100% wrong according to the Bible, according to the person of Jesus, according to being a Christian and what it means to follow. Pornography is wrong. It's terrible. It corrupts the soul. It corrupts marriages and, and young people and older people, and it's perverse, and it's degrading, and it's terrible. It's awful. But you know what? In a culture that has free speech, pornography is going to be present. And I have to be very careful that I don't stand up and push to say no more pornography, no more pornography, no more pornography. You know why? Because that very pushing towards that type of law might actually inhibit my ability to have free speech to preach the gospel. Now I should be mindful of are there, are there things we can do to make pornography more difficult to access? And how do we lean on the companies that are producing it? And how do we make sure people are of age that are looking? We can do all that kind of stuff. But I have to be careful to go, wait a minute. In America, a free society where people want to be able to have freedom of speech, part of that freedom of speech is people to be able to say and express things that I disagree with and not just that I disagree with that are wrong. And so sometimes the line between Politics and what we believe as Christians isn't always so clear. And yet, over the course of this series, I'm going to say things that some of you have the potential to interpret as though I'm giving you a political statement, and I'm not going to be giving you a political statement. I'm going to be giving you what the Scripture, I hope, says and what we believe as followers of Jesus. And as we move through this content, again, it's to help us be able to talk about it across the table in a my responses kind of way. Now, a couple of call-outs before I go any further. One is I want to give you a book recommendation. Several months ago, I read this book called The Secular Creed. It's called The Secular Creed. It's written by Rebecca McLaughlin. She's a Christian. And and as she worked through this secular creed, she, she gives us some really good biblical insight. Now, I don't, please know this, I don't agree with every single word she's written. But in general, this is a very helpful book to be able to look at. And it's not very expensive at all on Amazon. You can find it and get after it and read it pretty quickly. It's not very long. A very helpful resource. And I trust along the way some things that I'll reference from Rebecca in this book. The second thing that I know is that in this particular conversation, there's a lot of things that I'm not going to get to, not just this weekend, but over the whole series. And I'm sure there's questions. 
And we wanna do our best to be open to those questions and speak into those questions. And so here's what you can do. You can go to the engage page slash questions and you can submit questions. Maybe they're about one of the topics that we're gonna talk about. Maybe they're about a topic we didn't get to. And you can submit those. And I can't promise you that we'll answer all those or all those will get addressed in a talk from uh, the stage or anything like that. But, but here's what we are planning to do. As you submit those questions, uh, myself and probably at least one other member of the staff, we're gonna make a video where we answer a bunch of those questions and make it available to you guys. Where we just say, let's do our best to try and again, train and equip and respond appropriately through some of your questions. Now, if I was gonna have that conversation with my friend that night, and by the way, that particular friend and I have had the conversation in some form that we're about to have this weekend. We've talked about this. We've, we've, we've wrestled with this across the table together. But the, the very topic, how you get after that creed and process it, it begins with this question. It is the fundamental question that must be answered based on what any of us believe about any of those statements. And here's the question that we have to start with and we really have to build everything on. And it's this question, what is truth? What is truth? What is truth? Is truth real? How do I know truth is truth? Where does truth come from? And hopefully you're wired to say, I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> Some of you that aren't laughing because you don't know what that's from. There's a whole generation of us though that see a courtroom right now in our mind. Do we really want the truth? Do we really, really want to understand the truth? And what is truth? And where does truth come from? And how do we understand and process truth? What does truth do? Well, truth, truth helps us understand the big things in life. Truth helps us understand origins, like where do we come from? Destinations, where do we go when we die? Meaning, what the heck are we doing in life? Morality, what's, what's right and what's wrong? Ultimately, truth, it helps us know how to spend our money, spend our time, how to raise our kids. What's inbounds, what's out of bounds? How should I treat people? How should I feel about people? Can I pray? Should I pray? If I pray, who should I pray to who? And, and, if, and if I'm gonna engage people, do people of all races and financial backgrounds make sense or should I only be nice to a certain group of people and who decides that and where does that come from? And truth really is the creator of all of this. Because friends, at the end of the day, here's what truth does. Truth, once you say it, truth generates your worldview. Truth generates your worldview. Your answer to what is truth allows you to say what's in and what's out. And this, this matters so much because your opinions and thoughts around the creed, your beliefs are based on truth and what you believe about truth. And the root will result in a fruit. So whatever you build on matters. Whatever your foundation is matters. I would look at my friend across the table and I would say, okay, as we begin this conversation, as we process this creed, let me ask you this, this fundamental question. Do you believe in truth? What is truth? What is truth? Where does it come from? See, many, many of the statements, and I appreciate this about the creed, many of the statements in that creed have embedded in them the notion and the desire to give people human dignity. Part of where that creed comes from is it's, it's a lot of people looking, saying, we want every person to matter. We want every person to be seen. We want every person to be loved. We want every person to be cared for. But let me ask you a real honest question. Where does the idea that every person, no matter their race, their gender, their sexuality, their socioeconomic background, their age, where does the idea that every single person has dignity and should be treated with value even come from? Where's that even come from? Who says that's the way it should be? You, you may or may not know this, but there are people even now in 2023 in parts of the world who do not believe that that is true. Where does it come from that we should treat everyone equally with value, that everyone matters, that everyone should be seen as important, that everyone should be seen as significant? In fact, just on that particular notion alone, it has to lead us to ask the question, what is truth and where does truth come from? Around that particular area, I love what, just this particular thought, Rebecca McLaughlin says, she's quoting a historian named Tom Holland, not Spider-Man Tom Holland. 
but historian Tom Holland, and she says this in her quote, and you'll see it on the screen, that every human being possessed an equal dignity was not remotely a self-evident truth. Just hold that for a second. That every human being possessed an equal dignity was not remotely a self-evident truth. This is not something that people have always believed. A Roman would have laughed at it to campaign against discrimination on the grounds of gender or sexuality, however, was to depend on large numbers of people sharing in a common assumption that everyone possessed an inherent worth. The origins of this principle, the principle that everybody has an inherent worth, lay not in the French Revolution, not in the Declaration of Independence, and not in the Enlightenment, but in the Bible. And ultimately, here's what she's trying to say just around this issue of human dignity. Where do you even get the idea that we should treat everybody equal? Where does that even come from? And what she's driving at is, what's your source of truth? Is there truth? What is truth? Where does it come from? How do we understand it? And without an honest answer to that question, you can't even begin to deal with what the creed says. So I would look at my friend and I would say, do you believe there's truth? Because my response is, is I believe there's truth and that truth is gonna interpret how I see that creed. And then I would ask a follow-up question to my friend and I would ask this question to any of us as it relates to truth. Because this is really the question under the question as it relates to truth. This is the question that for some of you this weekend, you have to wrestle with because you've actually never wrestled with this. Because if I said, do you believe in truth? You would say yes. And then if I asked you this question, this is the question you have to deal with. Ready? And it's this. Is truth found internally or externally? And, and here's what you need to deal with with this. Internal truth, this is what you can maybe put in your notes, just a little arrow to it. Internal truth means you get to decide. External truth means it's decided for you and you have to find it out. Internal truth means you get to decide. External truth means it comes from somewhere else and it's outside of you. Now, some of you, what you want to do is you want to play this game where you take some external truths and then you internally decide what's true. And that's really still saying you're the arbiter of truth, which is really saying you believe in internal truth. People who believe in internal truth say things like my truth is your truth and your truth is your truth and you can have your truth and I can have my truth and can't we all just believe what we wanna believe? Just believe what you wanna believe in passion. As long as you believe it, that's good. As long as I believe it, that's okay. You do you, I'll do me. Your truth, your world, your way, all that stuff. And those people get to say, I'll, I'll take a little bit of this, I'll take a little bit of grandma, I'll take a little bit of the Bible, I'll take a little bit of Buddhism, take a little bit of that, a little bit of my politics, a little bit of my opinion, a little bit of mom, a little bit of dad, a little bit of that book I read in college, bake it three fifty. Bam, truth. That's what our culture in a lot of ways does. And that's what any of us ultimately do if we have eternal truth. External truth is when you say, no, it's rooted in something outside of me. Things that exist that are true outside of me. So it might be a God. It might be a book. It might be a special person like a, a, a rabbi or a pope or a, a specific teacher in a mosque. But it's external, it's outside of me and I don't get to decide it. They get to decide it. I have to see it, discover it, and then believe it. Now, in this conversation, you gotta hear this. If you're just, listen to this. If you're just left with eternal or internal truths and everybody gets to decide that, then we're all just living by opinions. And I'm not against opinions. You can have opinions, but you can't confuse opinion for truth. And here's what you know, nobody treats that creed like it's opinions. Whatever you believe or don't believe about it, if you live in such a way that you push back on those statements in our culture, good luck. I mean, watch how people will respond to you because they don't act like that's an opinion. And yet we have to ask, what is it based on? And eternal truth or external truth matters. Let me try to illustrate that through something that's shallow, but makes the point, you know, and I've brought this up before and everybody chuckles, but who's better, LeBron or MJ, Jordan? People who love Jesus know the answer is Jordan, but that's not the point for this illustration, okay? Here, here's what happens. It, 
people just go back and forth and they just, re they reflect from their opinion, their opinion, their opinion. But if you add an external variable reality to it, you can actually come to a decision if you pick something. So let's say you say, well, the better player is the one who has the more championships, then that's Jordan. The better player is the one who scored more NBA points, then that's LeBron. The better player is the one who's had a longer career, then that's LeBron. The better player is the one who's had more MVPs, then that's Jordan. See, what I did was I took it from opinions to I put an external reality that says that is verifiable and that's what it is. And you have to ask yourself this fundamental question in this conversation. Do you believe there is truth? And if you do, where does it come from? Now, as I would look at my friend and I would say my response is, I would say, do you believe there's truth? Where does it come from? And then I would look at my friend and I would say, hey, my response is this. I wanna let you know before I answer any of those specific things on that creed, my response is there is truth and that I don't get to decide what truth is. And that my answer to your question is rooted in truth that is outside of me. And then I may or may not go into all of this that I'm about to now, but I would, in essence, talk about some of these realities with my friend that shape my foundation for truth. I don't know, that, again, that I would quote all of these, but for us, I want to begin to quote some of these and show you this reality because as a Christian, we do believe that our truth is external. In fact, here's what it says in John chapter 14. John chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus, when talking to his disciples right before he's crucified, he says to them, I am the way and the next word. What word? He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. I'm the way. I'm the way to God. I'm the only way to God. If you want eternal life, I'm the way to that. I am life. I am the purpose for your existence. I am your meaning for your existence. But I am truth, right and wrong, in and out, good and bad, morality and immorality are decided by me because I am truth. The truth begins as a person. And Jesus says, if you want to know truth, it's not for you to decide. It's not for you to figure out. I am truth. And just a few chapters later in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying and he's praying to his father on his own behalf. Then he's praying for his disciples and ultimately he prays for us. But in his prayer for uh, his disciples, he says this in John 17 verse 15. My prayer is not that you take them, referring to the disciples out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Don't get rid of them, God. I need them to be here and be used. He would say the same thing for us. They are not of the world. They're not supposed to be of the world, even as I am not. They're supposed to be like me and be distinct from the world. And then he says this, sanctify them by the, next word. Sanctify them by the truth. And your word is? He's saying there is this reality that I am truth and Father, your word is truth and what people are supposed to be changed, set apart, be dealt with in their soul is by truth and it's my truth, it's ultimately me. Jesus in the next chapter in John chapter 18 is arrested. He's standing before Pilate. They're trying to find him guilty of a crime and they can't. And as Jesus interacts with Pilate in John chapter uh, 18, it says this as you begin in verse 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus is reminding us, this is not our home and we're not supposed to be concerned of the things that are here. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. I just love sometimes that Jesus is just like, whatever you said, that's cool, I'm good. He doesn't really fight him, but then look what he says next. This is so good. In fact, this is crazy. The reason I was born, Jesus says, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the? Truth. He said, I came here to testify to the truth. He said, there's a reality. There's a way things are that is outside of you. And I came to testify, to represent and to show that. And then he says this, and everyone on the side of truth listens to me. Jesus says, there are two sides. There's my side and the wrong side, the right side and the false side, the truth side and the untrue side, the people who get it and the people who don't. And he says, I've come to testify to that side. 
And oh, by the way, it's that side that will sanctify people and change people. And that side that is manifested through the incarnation of my son who came to earth to show you what truth looks like. Jesus then goes on to talk again about how he's saying, you know, he's gonna sanctify us by his word. And as we move forward, that gets manifested by authors like Paul and others saying how that's gonna show up. How is God gonna use the word to teach us? And so in 2 Timothy chapter three, 2 Timothy chapter three, verses 16 and 17, referring to the word of God, the word who has given us the word through his spirit, all scripture. What's the first word of that verse? What's the first word of that verse? All, all, not the parts we like, not the parts that our culture's hip to, not the parts that are easy, not the parts that annoy our kids, but all scripture, all scripture is what? It's God breathed, it's from God, it's not from us, it's an external truth. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. The scripture says truth is not up for debate. It's decided by the spirit of God and it's been given to us. And our job is to find it and wrestle with it and understand it. I'm not saying every time you pick this up, it's easy. I'm not saying it always makes a ton of sense. I'm not saying there aren't people who disagree with it. But what I am saying is even people who see the word of God and wrestle with what it says, their job is to work to see what it is. What did God mean? What was the intended truth? And once we get there, whatever it is, we submit to it. We submit to it. I remember as a young Christian, I was asked to memorize this verse, Psalm 119, verse 105. Psalm 119 is this whole chapter about God's word and his statutes and his commands. Your word is a lamp for my feet. It's a light unto my path in a life where things are confusing and dark and I don't make sense, what is it that guides me and shapes me? Your word is a lamp. It's a light. Friend, you asked me about the creed and I asked you if you believe in truth. Well, I wanna tell you what I believe. I believe there is truth. And the way I believe that there is truth is I would say this to my friend. I believe that Jesus is truth and truth is his. See, everything I'm about to tell you, friend, about how I feel about the creed is based on the fact that Jesus is truth and truth is his. That Jesus is the one who spoke creation into existence and because he's the creator, he knows how creation should work and even when I don't understand it, truth isn't just a concept, it's a person and that person holds all truth and so when I look at this creed, what I begin to do is I I look and I say Jesus is truth and all truth is his and so I'm gonna navigate it through that. I would start my response by saying, truth is gonna determine my answers. I've said it already this weekend, but I'm just gonna keep saying it. And I I love you, I love you. If you are a follower of Jesus, you do not get to determine what is true. You don't. You, You don't get to be shaped by the winds of this world, by what is popular, by what is pressing on you, by what might be difficult. You have to say, what does the Lord Jesus declare? Truth is a person, and that person holds all of that truth. And here's here's the truth. There's a lot of people that have come to a place, people in our church, who want Jesus Christ, but they don't want his truth. And that's not an option. The moment you do that, you have made truth internal and you have decided you can do that. Jesus does not give you that option. And I know that as we navigate, some of you are like, okay, but are those things true? Are they not true? What am I supposed to do with them? We'll get there. But what is very evident in our culture is that if you press up against what is popular, what is shaping us, Whatever word you want to use, canceled, ignored, not liked, disliked, hated, pushed aside, whatever word, it's made us afraid to really say, Jesus says it, therefore I believe it. This quote was originally attributed to George Orwell. It's since been pretty much debunked that he didn't say it, but I love the spirit of the quote. 
The quote says this, in times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. In times of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. Some of us, even across the table, aren't willing to be revolutionary. And yet Jesus is truth and all truth is his. I would look at my friend. Do you believe in truth? Okay, cool. Where does it come from? Because whatever you say, that's going to be where your answers for this creed have to come from. So I look at you. If you say you're a Christian or non-Christian, do you believe in truth? Where does it come from? What's it based on? How are you saying it? Now, what I want to do for the next few minutes, I'm not sure what happened in the, my responses. So let's step out of this for a second and let me really just be Pastor Keith to the church. And let me ask you some direct questions as it relates to processing Jesus' truth and all truth is his. Question one that I want to ask you, and I'd ask my friend this and other people, but, but I just want to put it in front of you, is this. Have you put yourself under the authority of Jesus? Have you put yourself under the authority of Jesus? Maybe a different way to ask it is, who do you really believe Jesus is and where are you at with him? What do you really believe about Jesus? And are you submitted to him and under him and seeing him as authority? I mean, fundamentally, I'm asking you, are you a Christian? The Bible doesn't just say that Jesus is Savior. It says he's Lord. He's Lord. He's master. He's in control. I don't know if you've had this experience happen where you're trying to find out, like, if one of your friends who's supposed to go somewhere with you, you, you ask them either via text or by phone, where are you? Where are you? And they say, oh, I'm, I'm five minutes away. I'll be there in five minutes, which really means they'll be there in 15 minutes. Right? And then if your friend says, I'm 15 minutes away, what that really means is they haven't left the house. And what you're really trying to do is you're really trying to determine where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Are they close? Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Please look at me this weekend. I'm honestly asking you, where are you with Jesus? It's a good idea is what you've been raised with. He's comforting. He's helpful when you need to pray. He seems like the best option. He's a good teacher. He's a good man. He's a good example. He's simply the guy who died for you. You like a lot of what he says. Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God in the flesh, who is worthy of all worship and surrender. Amen. And any other answer is wrong or at best incomplete. Teacher, yes. Example, yes, but not done there. He is God. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And you have to ask yourself, who is Jesus? Jesus is truth and all truth is his. And if you move to a place where you honestly believe in your soul, that's true. I think sometimes when you hear that at a church, you're like, I don't... Okay, does that mean I get baptized? Does that mean I say a magic prayer? Does that mean I, I, I do some catechism thing? No, what it means is you submit your heart to God and say, your God, I'm not. I need to follow you. You're king. You're right. I'm wrong. You are truth. I am in to submit to you. And for the rest of my days, I'm going to do the best I can to honor you with my life. Not so you'll love me, but because you love me. Have you done that? And are you continually doing that where you are under his authority? Because if Jesus says this is the way that it is and his truth says this is the way that it is, then that's what it is. And I know this, I know this, I know this. And it's, it's great that you're here and I love that. But there are a lot of people who go to grace who still are not surrendered to the person of Jesus Christ. Sometimes people will meet me and will We'll have coffee. They'll run into me at a ball game and they'll talk to me. And I go to Grace. Oh, that's great. Thanks. They'll say something kind to me. And I'll say, tell me your story, how you got to Grace. And, and they'll start to say stuff. And then one of, sometimes they'll say like, well, we just needed to be in church. We just needed to be in church. And I'll think to myself, you didn't need to be in church. You needed to be in Christ. There's a huge difference 
It's great that we're a part of this. It's great that we connect to this. But we need to connect to the person of Jesus. And not just so we know what truth, but ultimately for our eternity and our forgiveness of sins and for our direction, for our strength and ability to treat people the way they need to be treated. So are you under the authority of Jesus? Because truth, the truth is that Jesus is truth and all truth is his. And are you under the person of Christ? Second question that I would ask us this weekend, Grace is have you put yourself under the authority of the Bible? Jesus in his prayer was saying to his father, sanctify them by truth. Your word is truth. All scripture is God breathed. It's a lamp. It's a light. It's what leads us. The word of God is what changes us and sanctifies us. It's alive. But there's this temptation to dilute it. And to not live in it. I'm, I'm reminded of what the scripture says in 2 Timothy chapter 4. A verse that, man, it feels like it was written for our day and our time. It says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. Preach the word. Talking to a young pastor. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct and rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. He says you should teach people and be patient in doing it. And then here's what he says, Paul to Timothy. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. People will start to le uh, listen to and read and pay attention to people who just say what they want to hear. They'll turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. I'm not shocked that non-Christians don't believe the Bible. I'm very surprised how many Christians have stopped believing the Bible. My uh, oldest son plays soccer and I was at one of his games, this was last year, and we were playing a team that was not good and I knew we were gonna win big. In fact, at this point in the game, I think we were already up seven to nothing. In soccer, that's like being up 49 to nothing in football, right? It's a big lead we have. And I'm standing near the end uh, where we're trying to score at this particular point. And one of our guys takes a shot. And when he takes a shot, it's heading right for a defender. And for the other team, not a goalie, but the defender catches the ball. He catches the ball. He holds it for like three seconds. And then he says out loud, oh my gosh, a handball. Then he drops the ball on the ground. The official does not call a handball. I'm from like me to the front row to the official, to the line judge. And I said, are we just not calling handballs today? He turns and looks at me like I'm the idiot. And he says, shut up, go sit down in your seat. <laughs> Lord Jesus, give a brother strength right now because this is about to get ugly. I look back at him and I'm like, no, seriously, are we not calling handballs? He just gives me a dirty look. And then I thought, oh, maybe, maybe they had like a meeting before the game. They knew we were going to kill him. So they just decided, you know what? No handballs today. We're not going to call handballs. You guys are going to win so big. We just won't worry about handballs. Handballs won't go. And then I thought, no, that, that probably didn't happen. That'd be stupid. That's a varsity high school game. That, that probably didn't happen. And then I thought to myself, it's soccer and the rules are this. And that particular official in that moment just decided that that particular rule in the book no longer applies. We are living in a culture where people have decided that certain things in the book no longer apply. We are living in a place where people have just decided, I know that that's in there. I know that it's been that way forever and ever and ever, but not anymore, not in 2023, not beyond, not in my house, not in my culture, I'm done with it. And yet I would say, Jesus is truth and all truth is his and part of that truth is his word. And so I'm asking you, have you put yourself under his word? All of it, all of it where you have to say, I am submitted and surrendered to all scripture that is God breathed and is useful for correction and for teaching. I think some of us actually know what the scripture says. I love you, but we've become cowards to obey it. All scripture 
is truthful and we need to sit under it and be under it and follow it and submit to it. It is true if it says it and it's not if it doesn't. It is just the way that it is. Number three, this is related to number two. The third question I would ask you this weekend is have you begun to conform to the truth of the world? Maybe at one point you put yourself under scripture and then if question one is, or question two is you've just outright begun to ignore it. Question three is really, have you begun to drift and you don't even know it? See, there's a warning in scripture about conforming. Romans chapter 12, verses one and two. Many of you know this particular scripture. Therefore, verse one, I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship that if you're a follower of Jesus, you offer all of yourself to him. This is what it means to worship God, not just through song, but in everything that you do and everything that you are. And then he gives us a warning and a command in verse two, do not conform to the pattern of this world. We don't like to talk this way, but there is a pattern of this world. There is a reality that our children are in a made generation that is conforming them into an image. You know what it means to conform. Think about Christmas time when you roll out the dough and you grab your cookie cutters and you go and you go like this and you start to conform the dough to the shape that is what is going on. Our culture is trying to conform our culture into a particular place. And the Bible looks at us and says, do not conform. In fact, he says, do not conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing and his perfect will. I'm not saying it's not real because it is for some of us. Is the, the cultural pressure at work leading you to conform? Is the pressure in the dorm room floor leading you to conform? Here's what I see in our church. There are some of you that you believed the Bible said a certain thing until your child came home from school and said it no longer was that truth. And now suddenly your worldview have switched, not because the Bible switched, but because your kid's dealing with something. And I'm not saying there's not empathy and love and grace to whatever that is, but have you begun to conform? Are there evidences in your life that you've stopped conforming? You're, you're no longer taking God at his word, but you're starting to say out loud a lot more. Did God really say? Did God really say? Boy, that's not the way, it doesn't seem right. It's not the way I would do it. Did God really say? Have you put yourself under Jesus? Have you put yourself under his word? Have you begun to conform? Why? Because Jesus is truth and all truth is his. So I look at my friend. Hey, what's truth? What's it based on? Because everything that I'm gonna tell you about that creed is based on I believe that it's truth and I believe Jesus is truth and all truth is his. So everything I'm gonna say, it's not my opinion. It's rooted in something else and you don't have to like it, but I'm gonna try to tell you what I believe scripture says. And here's what, here's what I wanna remind you for those of you that are Christians, and if you're not a Christian, this is, this is the call of what it means to be a Christian. Friends, following Jesus is an all-in endeavor. Following Jesus is an all-in endeavor. Jesus didn't just call us to the idea of church. He certainly didn't call us just to not go to hell. He called us to himself to follow him. And following him is all of it. It's all of our money. It's all of our time. It's all of our thoughts. And it's all of our truth. It's his truth. Following Jesus is an all in endeavor. Have you begun to say that Jesus' salvation is enough, but I don't need him for anything else and I don't need his truth? I thought uh, in preparation for this, what should I ask you guys to do for this first week? And some of you will probably think it just seems self-serving. I don't think it's self-serving. I actually think it's helpful to say this, but your homework assignment is this. It's to be present for the entire series. Guys, it's too important of a conversation to just go, maybe I'll catch up with it online. I'm gonna, I'm gonna really speak to you if you're a parent. If you are a parent, particularly of college and teenage children, you owe it to them to be here and process this out. They're dealing with this every day. If you are a teacher, you're a coach, you're an administrator, and you're trying to shape young people, you need to know how to think about this stuff from a biblical perspective if you're a Christian. 
I'm just asking you to be here. Ah, Keith, we already have plans. Come on, go to a different service, go to Thursday night, find a different campus, make it happen where you say, I'm gonna be here and I'm gonna be a part of this. I tried to uh, find the origin for the phrase line in the sand and I couldn't find it. One of the first references it to, in the US was, it's commonly accepted as a reference to the action of William B. Travis, who in 1836, while commanding the defenders of the Alamo and contemplating a demand for surrender, drew a line in the sand and asked those willing to remain and defend the Alamo to their deaths to step across. I'm, um, I'm not trying to be melodramatic or hyperbolic, but I really believe in many ways this series is a line in the sand, not about agreeing on the creed, but about agreeing on truth. That do you believe Jesus Christ is truth and all truth is his or not? And this series, this conversation, it forces you to pick a side. Not the side to say all that's true or all that's false, but the side to say Jesus is right and whatever he teaches, that's what's right. And over the course of this series, you're gonna be tempted to go, do I agree, do I not agree? And what you're really doing is you're drawing a line and you're gonna decide. And listen, I love you. If you get mad and you wanna leave grace and you get frustrated and angry and you wanna fight, you're not fighting me. You're not fighting this church. You are ultimately wrestling with God. And this series is gonna come again, not to say I agree or disagree with everything, exactly what the creed says and that, but do I agree with truth and Jesus' truth? That's where I'd start with my friend. What is truth? And then your answer for that drives all the drop downs. Let me pray for us. Father, in this conversation, I pray that you would help us to have patience and mercy, to balance grace and truth, to love and serve well, that we would be a church that sees each and every person and how that creed may be impacting their life. And we would speak to it in a way where they, they know that God loves them. They know that we love them. In all of it, God, I pray that your spirit would do what my words never could, which is not draw people to philosophies and ideas, but to you. Make us more like your son through this series. Those who don't know you and don't know your truth, God, draw them to that. Give all of us a humility to learn, to receive, to be on mission to talk about these things. God, help us to be reminded that our answer in life, it isn't education, it isn't money, it isn't politics, it's you. And help us to put our hope in that. We pray this in the name of Jesus, amen.